Ready to go back to Rainbow Pond, the happiest place on Earth? I sure hope so, because today we're going to watch The Brave Frog's Greatest Adventure! We've seen a lot in the first movie, and yet at the same time, we actually haven't. I thought the first movie was like having half the series condensed into a movie when really, it was the first six episodes, if barely. Thanks to some offhand notes from those working on subtitling the original series, I learned about some of the things the movie changed when bringing it to movie form. Like, remember when Jonathan got upset over Goliath dying? And how after his father made up with him, it was followed by him still crying and taking it out on Pookie? Well, it wasn't like that in the original. The Goliath stuff was part of Episode 2, and it all ended with Denton making up with Ramaton, while Episode 3 had a sports event she encouraged he take part in that resulted in him failing, and that's why he was upset at her for thinking she embarrassed him. But probably the most concerning thing that I'll be looking forward to seeing how that affects the second movie is that Leopold's apology to both Pookie and Jonathan was originally just him telling them how his wife died protecting their daughter from a salamander. Not that it changes the fact that he had Mrs. Turtle killed off so his daughter wouldn't be distracted. Either way, it's just nuts that even in the first few episodes, it gets very dark for a series that lasts 39 episodes. Who the hell thought this up? Greetings, my dear media hunter. <gasps> Kafka from Final Fantasy VI, what are you doing here? <laughs> Shh. I am Kafka Palazzo, the Lord of Death and Despair, and I have come to your little abode to assist you regarding one of my oh-so-precious Death and Despair trio members. Ah, of course! Wait. Death and Despair Trio? What's that? It's a little nickname I decided to give a certain triplet of enemies from the early 70s done by Tatsunoko Productions, an upsell important studio that was responsible for shaping the early anime landscape of Langfo Samu Tezuka. They are in order of release, Konshu Monogatari Minashigo Hachi, Kashi no Kimoku, and yours truly, Kuroko Demiton. Hell, Demiton is even the most terrifying of my servants. Did you know that Hachi aka Hachi the Honeybee has the main character, an orphan honeybee boy, looking for his mother who was torn apart from him because of a wasp attack on their bee kingdom? Well, that doesn't sound so bad. It does sound like a basic setup for a kid's show, but as you've seen with Demiton, you know that it's anything but. In fact, it's even more cruel and evil than Demiton. So cruel that only 65 out of 91 episodes of the original series were dubbed in English by Saban back in the 90s. Like, there is an episode where Hatch sees a bug grow old and die over the course of a few days. Or one where a group of children accidentally kill their mom when trying to kill Hatch for reasons. And by reasons, I mean, they grew jealous of him! Damn. Oh, don't forget, there's more! Then we have Moku of the Oak Tree, which some of you obscure old anime and Pinocchio fans might recognize as Saban's Adventures of Pinocchio, which was a loose adaptation of Carlo Collodi's novel, and they use the word loose loosely. They pumped it from a few yokais, some child and animal deaths, Christian imagery, and Moku, aka Pinocchio, got crucified at least three times! I don't like where this is going. And now we're back to Demiton. When you start that second break frog movie, you should be thankful that you aren't getting some of the more fucked up material that rivals what you've seen or will see, even if it's not as bad as the other two despair shows. In one episode, a young turtle gets framed for ripping up a flower of Kiara aka Leopold, who then attempted to execute him by hanging, crushing with a rock, and dehydrating. In another, Demiton's family gets nearly sacrificed to summon rain for the drained pond. Oh, don't forget about the one where Kid Frog gets run over by a truck and you can literally hear the distorted scream that happens when he... Alright, I get it! What the hell were they thinking with this? Seems like I rattled your bones quite a bit. I'll spare you the more gruesome details and just give you these. Wait, these were from you? Indeed. I'd also like to add that the series is barely interconnected. The most connection they have is during the last five episodes, which incidentally is what the movie you're looking at adapts. But don't worry, I'll answer any of your questions along the way. Have fun with fail. <laughs> I mean, Demiton. Well then. 
Let's see what this movie has in store for me. Sure enough, the same opening from last time plays, which means more of Jonathan looking sad on the title card. Harmony Gold! Ain't no harmony like watching kids cry from constant abuse. Anyway, it begins with us peering into the pond and seeing a large catfish named Bruto, and who I guess is the catfish from episode 9 where it turns out they're giving food to so he doesn't eat them? Your tribute to me has been much smaller lately. I don't know if I can trust you anymore. Honest, I never done nothing like that. Don't interrupt me while I'm chastising you for pilfering or I'll gobble you down like a bug and then I'll find someone else to run the rackets in Rainbow Pond. Do you understand me? So I was right to use the Mafia joke last time and all this time it was for a giant fish that can and will eat anyone smaller than it so the threat is to bring twice the tribute by tomorrow or else meanwhile Pookie shows Jonathan a mirror fragment that happens to be underwater it's all cute and innocent so far but if we learned anything from just the first movie alone is that it goes from innocent to malicious very fast Seen here, where Zari the Crawdaddy takes tribute from Jonathan's father. You big fat boy! I'll show you! Damn, when'd you get to be such a fighter? Doesn't matter, they leave with the tribute and then we get some outsider mafia frogs wanting in? <laughs> 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 what are we laughing about? Ready for Jonathan blames Pookie for her father? Take three? Aren't you and I friends anymore? You're no better than he is. Every time with him. And yeah, I guess this means that Leopold's little apology and wanting to be friends with him was a freaking lie. At any rate, the three mafia frogs trick Jonathan into thinking they're missionaries of the Great Frog, wanting to overthrow Leopold so they can help the people of the pond. And since Jonathan is too naive for his own good, he goes along with their plans. First, they have him lure Zari to... something he says is edible. And then after he bites into it, he gets caught in some kind of fishing trap? Well, later it turns out to be a fisherman's trap, so I guess he's been hooked. Pookie tries getting her father to not have Zari be so mean, but it doesn't go well. Especially since he's trying to hide why he's collecting so much food. When he goes to look at it, he gets ambushed by the new mafia group, who then reveal to Jonathan they tricked him. <laughs> Gold. We have more children in pain than a 4Kids dub. After letting slip that he doesn't run the rackets, Leopold reveals that he was giving the tributes to Bruto, which I guess either Jonathan knows like these three, or it's based on an earlier episode that wasn't adapted in either movie. After some hesitation, Jonathan tries to save Leopold from being taken to see Bruto, but Fails. Later, Pookie finds him and asks what happened. Since Jonathan was pretty much responsible for this, he feels guilty and offers to go save him. Pookie and Jonathan's parents ask for help in finding both, but no will help. I don't blame them. I mean, we're dealing with one of the worst leaders of this pond. But he's already in the Forbidden Jungle, which is very scary at night. The villains meet Bruto and convince him that they'll take over for Leopold in collecting tributes for him. Quick, Jonathan, save him before Bruto or the screen distortions eat Leopold. He looks delicious. Yeah, hey, that's a great idea. Why don't you eat Jonathan instead of me? A young frog is bound to be better tasted than an old frog. Why, you fat bastard. Jonathan ends up helping anyway, since Bruto will just eat them both. During the commotion, a small cave-in occurs, due to a possible earthquake earlier, which hurts Bruto, so Jonathan tricks him into thinking that it was done by the three frogs from before, saying they brought a new monster to replace him. Bruto swims off to find it and finds the mirror shard from before. All that happens is that he doesn't realize the trick, bashes into the mirror and breaks it, and then the three frogs show up just to see what's up. Wise guy, huh? Say your prayers, punk! Good thing they don't have knives, because otherwise they could pull a Drax and stab their way out. As for Zari, as Johnny and Leopold spot him, they end up saving him before the fisherman pulls him up. And that's the end of that! We now cut over to Bruto, feeling bored and wanting to eat again. 
He sees Mr. Carp and goes to hide, but his whiskers get mistaken for plants, and... The gold earned chili plants that. Oh no, the old fool is coming this way. <sighs> I swan if that eat the gold dirt stubbornest plant I ever seen. You old dumbass. I don't know why Bruto doesn't eat him now when he's there. Yeah, he has to hide to make sure no one finds him and leave, but I'm sure it'd be easy to eat anyone who you spot right away. No, we instead have him hear Jonathan play his flute, and I guess he got over his little spat with Pookie since she brought him cookies. Pookie, do you respect your father? Well, of course I do, Jonathan. Why do you ask? How would you feel if you knew he was involved in something crooked? Well, I know he would never get involved with anything like that. Well then, what do you call literally everything he's done in this series? Either way, Bruto wants to get rid of him. But first, we cut over to this large frog coming to the pond and... Pity. What was that? Pity. Mm, I can barely understand his dialogue with the music overpowering it, but I think he said he's Tiger Joe, and he's leaving his tadpole eggs in the water. But then Bruto shows up to take them, and will only give them back if he helps him bring Jonathan to him. Also, as a way to kill boredom, and not to be alone, Bruto tells Leopold to bring his daughter down here to live with him, so he doesn't go up to the surface. Of course, Leopold is heavily reluctant, and Pookie somehow found her way here and overhears their conversation. As soon as you bring her to me, then you can return these eggs to that treasonous backstabbing wrestler. But he hasn't done anything yet. How can you call him treasonous? Pookie yells at her father for being a monster to the other people and even calls him a coward for doing this to protect himself. He offers to take her and run away from the pond and start over, even though the tadpole eggs would be eaten. But since Jonathan overheard everything, he decided to go to the lair and get them back. He has plenty of close calls, but he gets away. In the following scene, as Leopold and Pookie begin to leave... Morning, Mr. and Ms. Frog. It's wonderful morning, though, for good swim, huh? <laughs> oh yeah, we never did see Joe again after that initial threat. You got anything to explain that, Kafka? Oh yes, the big frog did attack Debaton, but it was an awkward sumo wrestling match. I have no idea why Harmony Go removed that scene, but they did. Also, that frog obviously wasn't rushed in the original. Just need to point that out. Yeah, I figured as much. Leopold apologizes for being a dick to Jonathan, while Jonathan decides they should all band together and defeat Bruto. Once again, we're gonna have to stick together, and we're not gonna do what Bruto says no more. We're gonna find a way to outsmart him and make this bond a decent place to live for all frog kind from this moment on. Friendship. I know this is supposed to be in the last few episodes of the series, but I don't trust Leopold enough that he'll maintain the friendship he made. Of course, it would help if they actually bothered to follow up on getting everyone together to deal with Bruno, because instead, Jonathan is just telling his parents not to be mean to Leopold since he's friends for no reason. It's not just the parents who aren't told anything, but even Mo and Kyle didn't get the memo. Company for her! He did not say that! <laughs> How can you be so certain? Because I know that Pookie's father is a gentle frog. I'm glad he won't get you anyway, you little jerk. He'll never let Pookie have anything to do with a tree frog. I feel like half the problems they have can easily be solved by just talking to each other. They end up fighting until Leopold breaks it up and actually stands up for Jonathan. Mr. Carp notices this and seems to take it well. As for Zari, he has two friends show up from... The word is over in Lobster Lagoon. So he was a lobster this whole time? I mean, I didn't want to assume he was a lobster since this appears to be a freshwater pond and they don't normally live in freshwater areas. That and his size is rather small for a lobster. Either way, he asks Leopold to let them help out. But he refuses, since he really does seem to be taking his new turn in life seriously. Not that he's willing to tell Zari that he doesn't want to abuse his power anymore, or that they should be working to stop the giant catfish from eating everyone. Even if it still leads to Zari and his friends wanting to cause trouble, at least tell them why you aren't looking to harm the civilians and hope that they follow suit. Also, it took this long for Bruto to realize he was robbed. Either way, he wants Pookie down here now or else. Leopold tells Johnny they both agree that Bruto shouldn't have her, 
but Pookie says she will if it means protecting them both. Please understand. Again, it would really help if you bothered bringing this up with people sooner so that you can better organize and without needing to give someone up. So yeah, on top of presenting a large tribute inside clamshells, Leopold is forced to give up his daughter. As long as she stays here, Bruto won't eat everyone in the pond. However... How did he get in there without being noticed? I don't know, the limitations in animation don't allow for such a detail. Mr. Hopper confronts Leopold, who eventually tells him about Bruto and what he was doing. Mr. Hopper finally understands and agrees to help him. Sure enough, Zari overheard them and plans to use this to his advantage. So what does he do? Go straight to Bruto. I regret to say that I'm here to report a terrible breach of your confidence. What are you saying? It's Leopold. He's plotting against you. Leopold! Okay, maybe not being open about your plans to Zari wasn't a bad idea after all. Makes sense, since out of all the characters I've seen, he's the only one that's actually successful in killing people. So he'd be the last person I expect any kind of redemption from. Then again, they could do like Dragon Ball did and have him turn good after the hero does them a good deed. I guess saving him from the fishermen meant nothing. And just to ensure that Zari isn't lying, he spotted Jonathan's hat stuck between the mouth of the shell he was hiding in, saying he was sent as a spy. Also, instead of eating the kids now, Zari suggests they hold them hostage so the people of the pond surrender, even though it's just two people so far. Speaking of, Zari sends his friends to beat up Leopold and Mr. Hopper. As for the kids, Jonathan plays his flute, which causes Bruto to sleep. They use one of his whiskers to try and break the cage open after it swings them into a wall. Now they can leave, but soon he follows after them. Wait, who the hell was that? Could he be Moe's father from episode 6 of the show? The one that tried killing Demiten but then got the crap beaten out of him? Care to explain, Kafka? Certainly. See, while Moe's father appeared in the beginning of the series, 6 episodes to be exact, he did reappear earlier in the episode when he returned where he fought Leopold's henchmen that deserted him. And was more or less here to serve as backup, with his own sword that he had in his introductory episode. <laughs> Well, he just got eaten, and I still don't see the point. It's so Mo has an excuse to be mad at Jonathan again. Mo gets upset and wails on Jonathan for the loss. Despite this, Johnny doesn't blame him and even offers to let him keep at it. Though Mo just cries. Also, since people are thinking of leaving regardless of whether or not a catfish exists, Mr. Hopper and Leopold try convincing them to stay by saying the monster doesn't exist. Of course, it's just to try and hide the fact that Leopold was originally with Bruto, which Zari decides to tell the people about and say that if they want to get rid of Bruto, they'll use Leopold as bait to lure a dogfish from episode 10 of the series to them, have it fight Bruto, and hope they kill each other. Of course, Jonathan defends him and says Zari just wants the pawn for himself, so... We'll just take both families, how's that? This is just very unsettling. I didn't think it was possible to surpass the first movie in terms of dark tone, but here we are. Zari tells Bruto what he told the people, so the intent is that he can tell them Bruto and the monster killed each other and go back to the old system of paying tributes. Although, it sounds like Zari intends for them both to die, because I guess the dogfish is equally strong. Either way, our heroes can only watch in horror as the two fight near them. And then... There. That was a close one. Are you alright? Wow, I sure am glad to see you. I'm... Kafka, I need you again. Need some more occult knowledge? Yes? 
Who are they? And why does Jonathan know them? Those crabs come from an episode where Demeton takes care of them. It's more characters that the movie glossed over on introductions, despite being important later on. That yellow fish that attacks Brutal was also in a prior episode where Demeton had to stand up for his manhood for running away from it and failing to save Pokey. Of course. Anyway, the fight ends up going toward where the others are since our heroes got away. And Mo almost gets eaten, but is saved by Jonathan. Since Bruto is still around after eating the dogfish, the townspeople are thinking of leaving. Jonathan and crew try to rally them into fighting back since this is their home and they should be able to fight for it. Mo understands and apologizes for everything. Soon, people that Jonathan and family knew and helped out before start agreeing to stay as well. Simple aerial reconnaissance. I know that the ocean is terribly big, but you would be surprised at how much you can see from up in the air. Another character that we've never seen because they skipped their episode. Sure. Mo and Kyle sneak over to the lair and overhear how Zari has an army they'll use to fight them? What army does he possibly have? Oh right, the water bugs. Plus, many more lobsters have joined. As for Johnny, he and the bird go to sea and ask a young eel that he apparently helped at one point to ask his father if he could help them fight Bruto. Want an explanation? Uh, I'll say it anyways. There was an episode where Demeton meets an eel and his kids, but all except one eel kid gets eaten by Bruto and the dad zap said catfish, establishing his weakness. At this point, I just assume Harmony Gold didn't care and just left this up as things that happened between movies. Of course, the father was caught by fishermen, and unless he can get out, he won't be able to help at all. For now, the inspector guy is sending an army of his own to fight. I will say now, this is the best part of the whole movie. I just love how almost non-intimidating they look in design, yet they downright kick a lot of ass in what limited animation they have. Zari's grip retreats and has to wake Bruto up if they're going to win. Meanwhile, Jonathan helps the little eel save his father by biting into the net enough to break it. Of course, since Johnny is a freshwater creature, he can't stand salt water for long and passes out. Addendum, the show had a scene where Jonathan was woken up via electric shock and he does this crazy face. Otherwise, it's round two of the big battle, now with blood effects. Well, I guess that's it, man. Brutus beat us. Now we've got him! What are you talking about? He's got us! We wanted him to swallow us! That's our battle plan! Oh my god. Are they actually... <laughs> This is the worst stomach ache I've ever had. Again, that's it, Inspector. Let him have it. Keep it up. Hi! Oh! Oh! Yep! <laughs> Eventually, Jonathan comes back with Mr. Eel, except Zari finds out and warns Bruto. Then, as the hero army arrives, they trick them into sending Mr. Eel into the cave before blocking him in. That way, Bruto can attack our heroes with ease. Thus, we get an epic battle between our heroes and the forces of evil. Hey, what's it, clown? Clown! I think you owe me an apology, Zari. Hey, listen, I don't owe you nothing. I'm taking over. Jonathan looks to be done for, but then another earthquake occurs. Care to explain that, or is that just a random thing that happens in some episodes? Actually, it's Bruto shaking the pond. Why or how is a catfish causing earthquakes? Well, because of a giant underground catfish called Damazu in Japanese mythology, which is what Bruto is a reference to. Japan's earthquake signs even feature catfishes on them precisely for this reason. Oh, so it's a cultural thing. Okay, well, Zari and crew get crushed to death by falling debris, Mr. Eel is freed, and goes after Bruto to give him the ultimate zap zap. <laughs> And thus, P 
peace and happiness returned to Rainbow Pond. Not that it ever was there to begin with, but Jonathan and Pookie are happy, so that's how it'll end. My god, that was somehow even more screwed up than the first movie's depressing storyline. Seriously, whatever I had to say about the first movie can also be airlifted into this one. There's more amusement to be had with some of the animation, as well as that whole battle against Bruto, but the mean-spirited nature continues to keep me from recommending it to everyone. Even with the changes Harmony Gold made, I can't believe they would go as far as having it be intended for children. Oh, you think that's bad? Remember the child death I mentioned earlier? What about it? Well, in Japan, there was a lot of merchandise made by Tatsunoko that was popular among children. And there's one that's a coloring book, featuring that very same child, right on the cover. What the hell is wrong with everyone? Now, did you know that my creator was partially responsible for this and the other shows I mentioned? Yoshitaka Amano? Correct. Before Final Fantasy, he used to work for Tatsunoko, which includes Moku, of course, who was his first character design credit. Otherwise, Amano also was an episode director for the first 21st episode of Demiton, and he also drew Hutch for an art exhibit dedicated to him in Japan. I guess that explains why you're here. You and this movie are cut from the same cloth! Yes, we both spare plenty of death and despair in our road of life, and because it was made by people who experienced the atomic their first hand back in the day, that's gonna screw anyone up. Well then, it's a good thing this movie is over. Now you can leave. So be it. But if you ever decide to return to the Despair Trio, you know where to find me. Ciao, and may Lucifer and Beelzebub. <coughs> I mean Moku and Hutch enlighten you some other day. Yeah, well that will only happen through the Patreon request here.